welcome to Hoxton Books and Tabula Rasa Gallery. And this is our second event. We're a pretty new bookshop, started in late April. So two weeks ago, we had a talk about British punk music and its influence here and also in Wuhan in China. Um, this is our second talk. It's about Taiwanese film, and we have a film critic and an artist here. Um, going forward, we still have in our like pipeline a couple more interesting events. One is a Christmas party, and then we have um, another talk on poetry. This is probably after the new year, and then later on in January, we have an event on the interaction between literature and art from a creator's perspective. And so, to keep up to date, you should sign up to our newsletter, and you can find you can find links to our newsletter on hoxtonbooks.co.uk. That's the that, that's the advertising. Okay, great. Um, and tonight's format is going to be where um, the two speakers will talk about forty minutes, and then we'll have a short round of Q and A, and then people can mingle and then you know get to know each other, etc. Um, let me introduce the speakers. So, um, on my immediately to my right is Peng Xiaoyu, Xiaoyu Peng. There, that's his name. He's the writer of this wonderful book. Um, born in Taiwan, and uh, uh, Xiaoyu went studied international relations at the um, inter uh, international relations and international business at the National Chengdu University in Taipei. So, for those who speak Chinese, it's Guoli Zhengzhi Da Xue Zheng Da, which is you know the LSE in Taiwan. All the presidents went there. Um, and uh, he moved to the UK during COVID in 2020 to study a master's in also in um, international relations, the political economy at the King's College, right? Yeah. And his writing career started in 2016 um, on films. He wrote for Opinion, Crossing, Thai Sounds. These, I guess, are Taiwanese titles. Mm -hmm. um, and more recently, since he moved here, um, he's got a column at the uh, United Daily newspaper, which is one of the major broadsheets in Taiwan. And your column is called Ban Shu Lun Dun, right? And yeah, in English, is kind of half, as in medium rare or half well down um, in London. Um, he's. Uh, Xiaoyu participated in many film festivals around the world, including Berlin, Locarno, Sundance, London Film Festival, and is a member of the Asian Cinema Observation Committee at the Golden Horse Film Festival in 2018. That's, that's based in Taiwan, and that's the most prestigious Chinese language film festival in the world. Okay, And his new book that's published in this year is called Dreaming in the Black Box. Hei He Zili the Monk. Yay, okay, well, thank you. <laughs> and sitting to Xiaoyu's right is Muskiki Zhiyin. Zhiyin. Um, Muskiki told me you can pronounce this name however you want. Um, and he's um, for the last 10 years based in Berlin, but you were born in Taipei, right? And I actually slightly rejected your introduction because I couldn't understand the, the, some of the, the more um, art criticism language. Yeah, I, I can also. Should, should I just introduce yeah, myself? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, basically, I'm a, a video artist, and at the moment, I'm doing an art residency here in London called the Fina Foundation, and. But normally I work uh, and based in Berlin, Germany. And uh, I know my, my CV, there's like a lot of, because it's a kind of the way we write to let the other art workers know each other. So it might be a little bit uh, Technical. technically or like un understandable for, for people who are not engaged in this too much. But anyway, so I'm uh, focused on normally, um, uh, we call the experimental uh, film or expanded cinema. And I also, so I mix um, of different genre and also documentary film was my, my focus. And my, my work was um, show, so some more maybe 
famous film festival will be 2018 in Berlinale and 2020 in Rotterdam Film Festival. And but I'm all so far I'm all do like uh, short film, which means under 30 minutes. So I, I haven't really released any feature film, which is longer than 60 minutes. That will be my future plan <laughs> when I had a budget. Yeah. So hope I will be able to achieve that. Thank you very much. And you're, you're also too modest. I, I need to mention that your film has been shown in the Pompidou Center in Paris. Oh, yeah. And you know, in Taipei Banyu and Shanghai Banyu, etc. And you were shortlisted for the 2019 Berlin Art Prize. Yes. And the winner of the Loop Barcelona Video Art Production, Production Award in 2019. That's it, right? That's, That's right. Yes. given out by the Han Nefkins Foundation and the John Miro Foundation. That's yes. both based in Barcelona. And you also started a couple of, you're part of an artist group called Fu Xing Han. <laughs> yes. That's in Taiwan. Yeah, that's uh, it's. Um, I'm also engaged in different because um, that was so you can imagine the Taiwan is very small and the art scene is we don't really generate a lot of profit and money maybe like everywhere. So a lot of young artists they work we work together. Yeah. So I engage in different groups and that was one of the groups I actually begin a, begin with. Yeah. Yeah. And you are also the founder of the research lab of image and sound. Yes, that sounds very technical as well. Um, so I'm just going to kick off with um, one question to each of the speakers. So first to Xiaoyu, mm -hmm. you you look very young and you are very young listening to your CV. And usually in this country, film critics are you know old geezers and they've <laughs> spent years watching films. So um, how do you? Perhaps compensate, or do you take a different approach to writing your re uh, to you know criticizing films or writing this book? Um, yeah, first of all, I'm just very happy to be here, and thanks for inviting me. And regarding your question, I think you know to be honest, I am not a person who grew up with films. I definitely watched film when I was little, but it is more like an entertainment to me, and I didn't, I didn't take it seriously. But um, I don't know if there's a Taiwanese, uh, yeah, I'm sure there's Taiwanese um, here tonight. And I was born and raised in Taichung, which is uh, a place, uh, which is a, con a, is a city in the central Taiwan. And, you know, even Taiwan is small, but outside Taipei, we barely could have the opportunity to see, um, I would say, like, arty general films, um, you know, other than those commercial, like, big scale um Marvel films, for example. So, you know, I grew up just film to me is just like um, a way to socialize or a way to entertain myself. And it wasn't until um, I moved to Taipei in, in 2015 to study for my bachelor degree. And I just found that, you know, the diversity and the resources of those, um, not just film, but also like arts, also like ex exhibition, cultural, all the cultural events in, in Taipei City was just blew me away and um, I remember so well that it, it was in 2017 um, there was a film called EE -E, um, directed by Edward Young and actually it was made in 2000 but uh, it has never been shown commercially in Taiwan for 17 years and that was the first time it is in Taiwan cinema. So um, I went to the theater without like, you know, knowing anything about the film or about the director. Just what a friend of mine just invited me to, to, to see it. And it's just like, why not? Okay, I, I, I've had the impression that it is a great film and it won a prize overseas, something like that. And I didn't know that it is the film that changed my perception of film and it just, you know, the way it portrays the alienation among Taiwanese society and, you know, the, you know, the, the, the collective anxiety that, you know, Taiwanese people are facing the new generation during, um, you know, the, the, the year around 2000. And that was just made me realize that, um, you know, film could actually be beyond my imagination. And I just, you know, I'm, I just fell in love with film, if you say that. And I started to, um, share my thoughts, I wouldn't say it's a film reviews on my social media 
on my Facebook basically and um, you know because I, I would like to you know to, to discuss what I thought and to know what my friends who act who also see the film um, f uh, things and I think it's it's always interesting to you know to discuss with other people that you know no matter um, how their their opinion might be different from you but I think it's um, you know it's just it, it makes me so um, you know so curious about films and I after um, I started like sharing my thoughts on social media I was very very lucky to have the chance to um, write a column on Taiwanese media and which was like which was really overwhelming to me at the moment because um, on the on the one hand it could help me reach a wide audience of course but on the other hand it is like it is like a pressure because it is a public platform, which means you have to be responsible for your words. You have you have to be really careful about what you write, and you know it's not just about uh, what you what what you what you think. Um, so it urged me to uh, do more homework, to take more courses, and to educate myself. And I, yeah, I think, yeah, I think that's how uh, it, it, it came from and also you mentioned about um, it's not like a young man job and I think that's you know that's quite interesting because I have a bunch of friends at my age maybe a bit older than me they also they are also writing film reviews but in different kind of platforms um, you know it is the era of social media it is that the whole media segmentation just divided everyone's attention so you know you know in the past people might re read a newspaper but uh, nowadays, no one, no one reads newspaper. And but you're writing a book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm kind of old school. <laughs> but you know, um, my friends who, who also write films, they, they, they did different kind of platforms, like they pr produce YouTube videos, they record podcasts. And I think, you know, I, I think that's great because at the end of the day, we all wanted the film to be seen by the public and we all have the same goal is that we, we, we aim to serve the films. Right. And yeah, it just, just cool. brought me about that. Yeah. And then a question to Ms. Kitty is, you grew up in Taipei and um, you're slightly older and then you've seen Taiwanese films. How has that experience influenced you, mm. um, as, you know, as a person and as an artist? Mm. Yeah, firstly, I also have to say, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to show some images that I was supposed to show earlier. These are. Ah, okay. <laughs> uh, do I need to explain those things or I don't need to? Uh, yeah, if you want, yeah. Um, I, yeah, uh, I was supposed to show you this when I introduced myself. It's like some <laughs> film I did before. I was research about the. Uh, so basically, it's about more sociology and anthropology study. Use film as media. I was research about the first uh, African, a national African collection in the National Museum of China in Beijing, and then I was discuss about this, how they established the African arts uh, collection recently in compare in comparison with the Western, you know, in the Western Museum, they start to return the problematic African sculptures. I was like, understand, try to understand why China need an African collection today. So it's, it's boring. Let, let's jump to, right. to what, uh, <laughs> to what Shao just mentioned, because it's very important for me. I also start with EE. E. Um, I also like Edward Young a lot. If, if somebody here and you haven't seen E, you have to see it because it's probably a little bit too old school today if you if you see today, but it does represent a kind of a generational like philosophy of or the feeling of society from that generation. And now I also feel it's kind of the end of some kind of era. I feel mm -hmm. like because after that I don't really follow any Taiwanese director anymore. I don't know. And also, you know what, I heard that uh, because Edward Young who made EE, he's a very important director and he's kind of leading this kind of Taiwanese new wave, I guess. And later, shall we will introduce more detailly. 
But I heard that where he 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 collect because he, he uh, during the time all these Taiwanese new wave directors they they gather together and they talk about film all the time. And there was a house. I think it belonged to Edward Young. Mm -hmm. So he's like it's a house where they actually all these very uh, avant-garde director like um, uh, you will mention later all these groups. They they all gathering in this house. And this is supposed to be a very important place for Taiwanese cinema history, but somehow Taiwanese government don't doesn't really care. Mm. And I heard when I was in the junior high school, this his house become an internet cafe or something. Oh yeah, I thought it was a restaurant. And maybe later on become a restaurant. <laughs> anyway, yeah, yeah. Maybe yeah. later on after internet cafe become a restaurant. Because I visit there. You visit there. <laughs> I was can see that if, if anything just like that. So for us it's like a very holy symbolic place, but actually you can see how our government don't really care. And and why especially for me very important is that um, because uh, this film is really film the place where I live. So Edward Young is a person who focused on this middle class life in Taipei. And that was the time when Taiwan's economy going pretty well, um, but people are losing you know, these kind of big city moments. So he's kind of trying to capture this uh, psychological feeling of the middle class. And I grew up in a similar, and, and also I studied in this elementary school where the main character actually studied one of the main characters study. So for me, it's really connect to me. So when I, I read Shaoyu's book, because she ma he mentioned E at the very beginning of the book, uh, for for person who can read Mandarin, please, uh, I think there's very few edition here in this yeah. bookstore. You have to fight for that. Mm. In <laughs> and for the person who can't read Mandarin, Go to reduce the class today. <laughs> you can learn. <laughs> That's very very good books, and I I, th I think we can go deeper later about yeah. the, the the contents. Yeah, sure. But yeah, you read the book. Do you have any feedback or questions for Xiao Yu? Yeah, yeah, I do. So I do notice in the books. Uh, so Xiao Yu is very attractive writer, but I have to say this book is not is not, and even today is probably not about Taiwanese cinema because. Shao Yu actually, in his book, he also mentioned a lot of history and the political circumstances in whole Asia, including uh, South Korea, China, Japan. So I think he started from the perspective of the Taiwan uh, film critics, but he started to capture many um, or to compare even different uh, conditions in different areas. For example, there's a, a lot of comparison between Taiwan and South Korea because it, it seems like South Korea and Taiwan share a very, uh, not very, but like a common kind of political states during the 80s uh, to, to 90s. So my question will be, um, so through this book, as a Taiwanese film critics, what you want to capture through this book. You want to kind of compare the film industry in general in Asia, or what do you want to achieve through this book? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, um, when I was, when, when I made up my mind to publish the book, I just, you know, I, I, tr I tried to like, I, I wanted to have a message, I wanted to have a, have a logic, and and the first thing I did was to write down the core values that I'm going to discuss in each chapter. And the first chapter is just about what you said, about history, about politics. And the name of that chapter is called um, Speaking to Remember. And most of the films I, I selected are from South Korea. And there are also like films from Taiwan and Germany. And, you know, I mean, they are all countries that have gone through a conflict between um, autocracy and democracy. And I think it, it would be um, you know, an interesting comparison to, for us to explore that, you know, how other countries present their history and their like, um, political tragedies in film. And or for, for example, South Korea is a really good you know, example for us to 
um, you know, tech, tech reference because they have gone through just like as you said, they they have very similar um, history as Taiwan did. For example, like we all have um, been colonized by the Japanese, and we all gone through a, a, a long period of time of dictatorship, and we develop our, our economy um, in the in the like, I think it's in the in the seventies, and we all have our democracy. We all um, fight for our democracy in the late eighties. And you know, later on, we we suddenly we developed a a a, a different kind of roots. Um, you know, what we see nowadays, and I think it's very interesting for us to, you know, to explore that nuance um, through films. And also, I because I study international relations in my college, and also I study the related um, major in, in my master, and um, I think it's just kind of. Give me a different perspective to um, to interpret this. Um, I, I would say, um, you know, this the, this this background and what this his history would t- would teach us um, if in in films. And yeah, I mean, the the, the book was. Um, I didn't assume that which country I'm going to pick at first. I just choose the right film um, which is aligned with the with the chapter. And the first, just as I, I just as I said, is about history and politics, and um, after that, I dis- um, I started to um, discover myself because you know, like pursuing who we are or um, finding who we who, who um, you know our true self is a common topic in in films, no matter in which countries. And I think that's you know that's also how I found um, you know connected with films. Um, we when we are like we are, when we are moved by a film, it is most of the time it is because we see ourselves in the character or in the storyline, and I just think that it is it is um, I I was intrigued by you know that that kind of connection, so I, I I I chose it to be the second chapter, and later on I just discuss more relationship like love or a uh, love between lovers or love between families and love uh, ranging from um, genders ages and different kind of eras and not just only about how to love other people but but more about like um how we can deal with a relationship when a love is fading away and i think it's not just about romance it's, it's more about how we deal with this kind of complicated aspect of love and yeah i mean lastly um i i just expand the whole discussion into a large larger picture I discussed more about like um, our existence with the outer world for example like the disaster such as pandemic um, how they tasted how they um, challenged our um, humankind and what can we see when 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 you know how fragile our humanity during this kind of um, you know this kind of whole pandemic thing so yeah I think it, this kind of concludes what I want to say in this book um, I I just you know, I just wanted to, I just wanted to have have a, you know, to have a, have a logic, not just about every single film, every um, you know, every articles I wrote about films, and yeah, I, I wanted to have an order. I wanted the, the, the readers could, um, you know, to receive the message that I, I, I said it. I really like what you said that lots of films um, is about how a person or a protagonist finds himself, and and I think tonight. You have prepared a presentation. It's almost through a film or a history of film how a country or a state finds itself. And um, so I'm just shall we go to this? Um, it's a PowerPoint okay. um, assisted talk. So tell me when you need the next slide. Um, okay. First of all, um, this book is not about Taiwanese cinema, but when Ifan invited me to yeah. do a talk about Taiwanese cinema, I, I just Wondering that what can I say in, in, in this you know in this talk that could make um, people that have might have no understanding of Tony cinema could you know have a, at least have a further understanding of it. So I remember when I yeah when I fell in love with films, I just I really I'm really desperate to know um, you know how our how the domestic how our country cinema have gone through um, in the past decades. And I, I, I remember I took a course in college and which is exactly called um, History of Taiwanese Cinema. And that course just 
helped me a lot about like knowing our past of cinema and to figure out that you know what we have gone through and what we might be in the future so you know just um just want to say i'm not a professor or you know i'm not a, an expert on on, on Taiwan on Taiwanese cinema but um i really want i really i'm really happy to like to be the one to introduce Taiwanese cinema to you know any audience that might not know before. So that's the reason why I need this draft, because I'm not a professional. So just forgive me if, I, um, if I'm wrong. Okay. And now, um, I just, I, okay, the, 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 I divided um, the, the whole history in, in every decade from the 1950s, but actually it is not um, the time when Taiwan has our own films, but it is a, a critical moment when Taiwan started to you know, make our na native film after the Japanese colonial period, and yeah, and also um, you know in the, in the past in the in the fifties because we, we speak Mandarin right now in Taiwan, but there's another for your information there's another language called Taiwanese, and um, which might be understood by most of the Taiwanese, especially for the older generation, but you know it is it might be hard to imagine, but in in the fifties there. It was the golden era of Taiwanese language films, and more than two thousand Taiwanese language films has been made from um, you know in the, in these 30, 30 years, mostly in the in, in the fifties, and it was the time, you know, the, the the civil war in China just ended, and you know the Cold War just haunting the world, and you know Taiwanese people is suffocating by all of this, and they just need a way to you know to to like. To, to, to resonate themselves. And Taiwanese language film just perfectly, perfectly played a role of that. But, um, you know, unfortunately, they are, these are, the Taiwanese language film are mostly made of lower quality by like short sighted investors. So um, it didn't last long. And also, like uh, the government, they decided Mandarin Chinese to become the official language in Taiwan. So it's um, to some extent, the, it's oppressed the development of Chinese language film, so it started to decline in the late 60s. Okay, and now um, I'm going to show you one of the most imp uh, important film, important Chinese language film made in 1958. It's actually the blockbuster of the film um, during that time, and it was a film. Um, they have two characters, and one of them are uh, one of them were told by the fortune teller that. Um, he, he can only just leave like uh, a, a couple of months. So they decided to went on to go on a tour in Taiwan to you know to spend to have fun in the rest of his life. And uh, fun fact, it was it, it got inspiration by by the famous British comedy tour called um, Laura and Hal Hardy. I don't know if you guys know that. So yeah, just let let me show you the clip of it. Um, maybe I should let it buffer for a bit. <laughs> Shall we go back to the video? Mm, I like downloading the videos. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Let me go to the video. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is a disaster. I'm, I can't even pause it, so wait. Um, can I ask, ask a question before, like, while well, this is like buffering? When you say Taiwanese language, you're talking about the indigenous Taiwanese people's language, or no? Um, I think it's like kind of like a 
for Kim, I, I'm not sure what that is. Uh, but it's, okay. it's, it's different from the indigenous. It's because there should be many more indigenous languages in Taiwan for it. Yes. Right, yeah, okay. And these, so these were made by mainlanders? Mainlanders, yes. Okay. Um, so now we don't even have the, the Google Drive. Let me try it. Shall we try again? Present. Okay, so shall we just skip this clip and then uh, I'll try to make it try to make it work. Um, yeah. Because there are like more. Points. I know there are more. Yeah. Okay. Maybe you, you carry on with this. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah. If you if you see, if you see that <laughs> you will know um it's kind of like um it's more it's 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 still like um you know a, a bunch of people that go sightseeing as an outsider you know it's like a tourist but um actually it touch a bunch it touch upon a, a lot of like Taiwanese civil life and it, it also provided um you know, a valuable resource that we could, you know, understand what Taiwanese people look, and what Taiwanese people, uh, civil life look like during, during the 50s. Yes. Yeah, so next. Yeah, and um, when we were in the 60s, and when the Taiwanese language was declined, and uh, the, the Mandarin film just grew much stronger with the support of the government. And there was a genre called healthy realism, um, it is actually it is, it is um, inspired by the Italian neorealism, but it is not a, a completely neorealism because it also um, you know served the political aim of the government. So it it it, it will avoid the um, you know realism dark and like more true side of time of of you know people's life, but focus on more positive and morally correct uh, correct thing in the films because Taiwan was still under the martial law. During then, and yeah, and um, the first healthy realist production is, is a film called Oyster Girl, uh, directed by Li Xin and Li Jia, and it's, it is actually um, also the first domestic color film um, that was shot during then. This. I'm going to use the um, hot spots. So the next slide. Next slide. Next slide, please. Yeah, and we um, uh, step into the 70s. Um, it, it is a dramatic stage um, in terms of Taiwanese diplomatic history because um, when the PRC gained recognition from most of the major countries in the world, which is post a huge threat to uh, the international status of Taiwan. So in order to like whether um, reducing the fear among Taiwanese people or um, magnify the legitimacy of the KMT regime, um, the government just decided a patriotical um, campaign that, um, you know, make more national policy film, which served, which actually was a propaganda film. And um, so it is the time when, you know, there are many propaganda films that shot about the history, um, like how the government, how nationalist army protected China from the Japanese military. However, um, at the very same time, there was another genre, just totally up, up, um, opposite from the propaganda film. It's called Chong Yao film, and because the writer of it is called Chong Yao. And it is more like um, a romantic and more than, like melodrama, talking about a love triangles, like she loved him, but he loved another woman, just like something like that. And it, it sounds a little bit cliche or cheesy, you know, nowadays to us, but it actually provides um, a really good way for Taiwanese to escape from the reality during the, the kind of tense um, moments. And yeah, next slide. Yeah, um, it is one of the propaganda film called 800 Heroes. I'll try to play it this. Okay. It's, um, it's about one of the most significant battles in the Sino-Japan War in the, in the 30s. 
um, it, it was she was a girl who was brave enough to send a national flag to the um, to the KMT military in, in order to encourage um, you know the military, and which also shows the resilience of the government. Okay, let's see if I can get fired directly. The propaganda of Yong would look bad, and and we like in China they they remade this film this year. Right? Yeah. yeah, or last year was shown this year. Exactly the same. Yeah, Ba Ba Zhong Shi. Yeah, but it's a totally different history from their perspective. What's the difference? Like, the... um, I think it focuses more about like how uh, CCP they you know, they just changed the the object from KMT to CCP. That how they are brave to um, you know to fight the Japanese military. And was that uh, shown in Taiwan, the film? I don't think so. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's go back to the slideshow. Yeah, at the same time, we can also see how a Chong, uh, how a Chong Yao film looked like. It's like not a different world, but you know, this film was made in 1976, and this film called Cloud of Romance is also one of the uh, most important films in in uh, in the uh, genre of Chong Yao film, it's a blockbuster during that, and it's made um, in 1977, so it's actually the same era. Right. Okay. Was the was was this film written by Chong Yao herself? Because she's a like a romance writer. Mm -hmm. So th this is her novel, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I think that's enough. <laughs> and yeah, what's you know what's interesting is that the the actress you see from both clips are the same person. It's called Bridget Ling, which is actually um, the goddess. I would oh, say right. the goddess in Taiwanese cinema of that generation. Well, what's her Chinese name? In Qingxia. Oh, oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, this, I downloaded the very first clip, so the uh, um, the comedy. So let me try to show that. This is the Taiwanese golden age, Taiwanese language film. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
And it was really massive during that time. It was a huge blockbuster. Everybody know Wang and Liu. And yeah, and then we could, you know, we will be in the 80s, yeah. the 1980s. Um, it was just like, it was just the era of new Taiwanese film. I, I believe that is, um, most of the Western audience know Taiwanese film, um, you know, because you know, people were gradually, like, t they are tired of this impractical and over fantasizing way of shooting films. So um, a bunch of young filmmakers, they, they started to make film in the ori original way. They, they explore the, um, you know, the social problems and the struggles and also the, um, you know, this kind of collective anxiety between, uh, among the Taiwanese uh, society. And, you know, the 80s is also, was also a critical uh, decade for Taiwanese um, political history because it was a time um, when the martial law was ended and which means that um, you know the filmmakers could have more freedom to create what they want and just like um, you know Edward Young and Ho Chao Shen that we all I think we all know is a film master and he also influenced um, Tang Liang and, and Li in the second wave and you know what's worth mentioning is that um, the the documentary also scored much stronger in Taiwan during then because I think because you know we uh, Taiwanese society become more f uh, become freer and you know more film could reflect what truly happened uh, in in the society so uh, there's a um, uh, important film festival called Taiwan International Documentary Film Festival it was founded in during that time and we are going I'm going to show you um, a clip. Yeah, these are film genius. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and this film was called uh, the Sandwich, the Sandwich Man, and it is it is um, seen as the starting point of the Taiwanese new cinema, and it's actually the uh, it's a an, an anthology uh, which consists of three films in. Um, you know, in this film, and I'm going to show you a clip of the third story called The Test of Apples. Um, I can actually, uh, we don't have to do this, we, I can do the file locally, Taste of Apples. Yeah, you can uh, compare um, what it looks like with you know, the previous film, you see it's, it's a lot different.他非常抱歉请你原谅同事请你尽量跟我们合作就是你啊哎呀你开车太不小心了你的车子那么大有开我在横着看到你了我一直下一直下你也偏偏把我弄过来现在他弄到了再说什么也没有录用了故意让阿
They try to portray the oppression, the problems, the light under the Taiwan society. And it, it also, um, you know, we, we can also see a lot of that, the gap between the rich and, and, and the poor during that time. And yeah, it takes a lot of the most masterpiece. And yeah, the, um, this kind of, this influence um, have an impact on many film directors like Hou Xiaoxian, next, Hou Xiaoxian, yeah, in different films, and also like Edward Yang, and also like Ang Lee, which uh, was more, more, uh, much more focused on the conflicts between the West and the East. And, and, and this is the documentary, yeah, which, uh, which is actually the first um, documentary that is shown in Taiwanese cinema. So um, it is quite important. Okay, and then we, we went and we entered into the 21st century and actually Taiwanese film has um, have gone through um, a, a long period of decline during the 2000s. Uh, most of the reason because under the US government, we were forced to open widely to all the Hollywood films. And you know, we, we entered the WTO in 2001, which means that almost no limits on foreign film screen in Taiwan. And it just um, hugely shocked the uh, domestic film and also like the box office. And um, also at the same time, the relationship between uh, Taiwan and China has, has changed a lot during the during 90s. For example, like in 1996, Chinese film were allowed to um, firstly shown in Taiwan and they were qualified to enter into the Golden Horse Film Awards, which is one of the most important awards, film awards in Taiwan. And yeah, the talents would um, you know more ha would have more opportunity to you know to work with each other, and this kind of box uh, box office depression has um, ended until a film called Cat Number no. Seven, which um, during that became a, a huge um, cultural phenomenon, and it is still the highest grossing Taiwanese film um, until now. Yeah, this film, I believe. Most of us know. Yes. Yeah. And um, yeah, 2010s to present, which we are going through. I mean, um, you know, we can obviously see more diverse genres in, in Taiwan, especially in recent years. And you know, films are still deeply affected by the political circumstances, but <coughs> it is not from the government, but more from the society and the environment. For example, like. Um, queer cinema in Taiwan has um, stood out in in Asia um, like since the 90s and when the same-sex le marriage legalized in 2019 we can see more and more this kind of um, discussion about LGBTQ plus community in Taiwanese cinema and also um, younger generation of the Taiwanese filmmakers are more willing to touch upon like sensitive topics um, like politics and history yeah I think you know we are still find, finding a route, um, you know, other than the, you know, the, the famous master, like Ho Xiaoxian, Edward Young in, 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 the, in the 80s. And um, yeah, I believe, you know, it takes more time for us to know exactly what we are going through at this moment. And these are some, some films that um, show the diversity of the industry in, in, in the recent years. Can you talk about what they're about? What they're about? Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, City Bao, I'm not sure what it's pronounced. It's, a, it's about um, a famous, um, I would say, it, it's a, a Aboriginal tribe that uh, fought uh, against the Japanese uh, oh. yeah, during the 1918. 18, 18, sorry, I'm not sure. In the 19th century? In the oh, oh, during the Japanese occupation. I think it's, it's like 1930s or something. Right. 20th, 20th century. Okay. Yeah. And this film is um, adapted by um, a Chinese novel. Um, it's, um, yeah, it's, uh, I don't know. I don't know how to describe it. It's just, um, it's, an, <laughs> it's, really hard <laughs> it's hard to, to describe. To, it's hard to define. <laughs> Very little happened. Yeah. Okay. And, um, yeah, this one is also hard to define. It's just, 
<laughs> but just, but the last one I have is I can tell a story because uh, so that was you see uh, at the corner it's a uh, nominated in a, it was in a Berlin competition mm-hmm. I think it was uh, 2020 right yes. yeah. and that was a time I, I was there um, I also met uh, Chen Min Liang we were in a like, Taiwanese film party yeah and that was the beginning of the Corona. So, and then right after, I, I remember that was the day we heard, because in Europe it was kind of gloomy, you don't know what's going to happen, and they believe still it's not, nothing to do with them. Mm-hmm. And then we, we heard that day the Korean Cultural Center was shut down because they're, one of their team members in the Berlin got a got a virus, so they have closed everything. And then we were like, lucky, yeah, we still have a Taiwanese party. <laughs> and, then, and then when I went to see, uh, I went to see many competitions. And I don't know if you know, that was the year of Hong Sang Shou. So it's, uh, it's, he was, he's a Korean art um, director and he was a big winner that year. But before we knew the, the results, we were like thinking, yes, our time is gonna beat, gonna beat him, yes, and in the party. But then, then we lost. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I got the, the teddy bear for the, the queer film, right? Mm-hmm. That was still very, very nice, yeah. Yeah, it's just a bunch of romantic films that happened in the campus. <laughs> right. And um, this, kind of, um, this kind of film, I think, is, is interesting to say because um, we can see that a shift from art films to you know, genre films that is more frequently shown in Taiwan, in Taiwanese cinema. And um, the director, Chong Wei Hao, is, is, um, is a famous director who, who like, directed a series of this kind of um, folk, folk, uh, folklore adapted horror films. The, uh, yeah, Hong Zhao Yu Hai. I think there are three uh, tri- trilogy of, of that film. And these are um, LGBTQ plus film, but in different kinds of perspective. And you know, you know, this this kind is, and this one is more like traditionally shown um, that we fam- we are familiar with. Um, you know, more like a romantic, more like a uh, suffering gay film. And um, these two are a bit different. They try to um, you know elaborate the dilemma, the dilemma of you know what. Uh, um, you know what a queer might face when they are in marriage, and just give uh, I think it's give Chinese audience much more um, you know room to you know to explore explore the topic explore the topics because there are still a lot of Taiwanese um, I would say a lot of Taiwanese people who are against um, LGBTQ plus community, and I think you know because this and this film and these three films um, have a I think have a great performance on, on box office, so it's in, to some extent it in, in, uh, improve the understanding for Chinese uh, to understand the community. Yes, okay. that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and now it's time for you to think of questions to ask our speakers. Um, but maybe you have well, I do have one time. question, and it's, I think it's also probably people also want to know because we always uh, we easily compare South Korean film industry and Taiwanese film industry. And I know that when we entered WTO, when when you just mentioned when the whole all the Hollywood film came into Taiwan, and that's really a big change for the Taiwanese film industry. And I knew that also actually Korea and South Korea also experience the same thing, and. Uh, can you maybe just, and then we can see after that, uh, Taiwanese film industry is kind of all, it's suffered from a very big depression for a very long time. But on the other side, uh, we can see a very huge development in the South Korean film industry. And uh, maybe you can just share your opinion or you can analyze what makes these two places how they face in a different attitude and how that result in different results. Mm-hmm. Although we all went through like similar kind of uh, historical path. Yep. Um, yeah, because you know South Korea 
film like the government they have they had a policy called uh film quota they they um like they dis they uh elect they designed or they set a, a bunch of call that you know it's gonna for example like it's gonna to screen three korean films then you can uh screen one hollywood films during um like during the 60s 70s and it's just kind of last a, a long time in korea but you know many people nowadays would think that they, that was the reason why south korea um south korean films is successful but you know in 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 the reality because of that i would say that the protection policy um south korean film were made um really low quality and you know the audience just don't want to see korean film because they, they know that you know it's 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 um it's more like a price to you know to to see a hollywood film so um just like you say they they have you know they have been struggling a lot during the you know during when they they have to um like enter into an international organization they have to apply to that um policy to open up the, the film markets and um i would say they they compromised a lot and you know a lot of filmmakers in Korea they just went up a protest on on that and just said oh, no we're going we're not going to open our markets we're not going to you know let the Hollywood fully let the Hollywood um, film in South Korea and um, yeah definitely just as I said it it was a compromise it it is not like completely open widely uh, widely open as Taiwan Taiwan is still but it's still um, you know it still let the Hollywood film to compete um with the south korean film instead of just protecting it um completely and i would say that you know we see the south korean film was so successful especially in the recent years but that is not um you know that doesn't happen by by chance that is their um you know their development in like a few decades with the support of the government and they have developed a mature um, industrial chain uh, for example like they have a, a really uh, many many filmmakers or many writers that have gone um, have international experience from the Hollywood and they know how to tell a story well and they know how to, what is the common language of a film is um, you know even though the topic is is, is not really familiar by um, the Western audience but you know it is and at the end of the day, it's more important to you know tell a story in a in a, in an attractive way, and I think that's what um, you know South Korean films has just um, you know just grabbed our attention attentions, and it's just um, they have different kind of genres. They have art. They have um, you know you know more arty genres like the Chang Dong, the Hong Sang Soo, but they also have a bunch of new directors. Who exactly know how to communicate with the international audience, um, you know, in, in, in the commercial films, and they know how to combine with the, you know, the commercial elements, a like thriller, that like comedy, or you know, some tear bombs into a serious topics in their film. I think they incur incorporate very very well, and um, you know, compare with that, I think you know what Taiwan needs um is that we we are always looking for a master to appear in Taiwan's film industry and i don't think that is you know that is healthy because um it is more it matters more about how an in industry will, will work by itself it's not about one person it's not about you know how how talented you are and it's about you know how supportive our industry could give the the, the filmmakers so yeah i think um, even though I I I um, I don't know even even though all of this I just I'm I'm still positive about um, you know Taiwan's film film industry because we can see that more and more um, young director they they are like um, brave enough to um, challenge that this kind of genre films that we we presented in the PowerPoint and you know we can see that the Taiwanese audience are more open to that kind of films so yeah I think. I do like uh, you did mention, but I also want to mention to also to our audience this filmmaker called Mi Zi, Zhao De Ying. He's also like very, I'm very um, attracted by his, the, the language he used, and also because today Taiwan has many 
like uh, we call that second generation of immigrants. So they all have like different background from Southeast Asia, and they all start to bring all these different perspectives, which can, I would say that also create a new kind of filmic language different from the older generation, and I really look forward for that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, I, I Oh, you have a yeah. question. Oh, cool. oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a question. Um, you know, because I have watched your feature film, The Sculpture, okay. and um, I, I found it really amazing that you, um, you know, explore the geopolitical relations between um, Asia, Europe, and Africa through arts. And we, we knew that um, he's born in Taiwan, based in Berlin before, and now in London. So I'm wondering that, um, you know, what, how this kind of international experience have an impact on you know your project in terms of like choosing your materials or topics or that the difference of the audience and environment you are creating. Okay. Yeah. Um, first, thing I have to say I'm also very uh, nervous to to be shown here because I'm not. I don't have a film background. I didn't study film. Me too. <laughs> no worry. <laughs> but yeah, like my friend Zoe always say, she say that uh, when you are, uh, Zoe is here by the way, uh, she say that uh, if you are artist and you talk with, uh, with a few people about art, and then when you meet film, uh, when you meet an uh, artist and pretend you know film a lot, so you can both looks pretty well in different words. So here I will try to talk <laughs> some art things with you. So yeah, basically yes, I, 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 but I actually, I went to Chicago Art Institute for their film uh, department because I'm a big fan of uh, Api Japon. Mm -hmm. And I think Hong Sang Su is also graduated from there. So in Chicago Art Institute, they have a really great, uh, experimental film education system in Chicago. So that was my, the f I would say that that experience also changed me a lot in the way that I start to focus on uh, black studies because I don't know if you know that in Chicago it's a very the racial segregation and everything is very obvious like Chinese people white communities and black communities and also in the school we talk about this a lot which I never hear before in Taiwan so basically in Taiwan there is no such things in our school and and then I remember I was because I, I couldn't find any house and, and I also I only did an exchange semester so I only stayed half a year and I, I was urgently to find a house, and the Chinatown was a place where I could find a house very easily because I, I, I speak Mandarin. But if uh, for people who ever been to Chicago, you might know that. So Chicago is divided by like a, there's a city center, and in the north is where the white communities live, or we will say like higher class. And in the south of Chicago is uh, black communities. So it's supposed to be a lot of um, more uh, lower class. And then the government obviously they rebuild the Chinatown in between, so to separate two communities, and that's where I live. So every time when I go back to home, you can see from the platform on the one side the, all the white people or like rich, why well, I would say higher class people go to the other direction, and the other side is Chinese. Probably Asian, I'm not sure if they are Chinese or Asian, but like Asian and also the black folks to, on the other side. So it's like already very clear in, in the middle of the subway platform and people are separate. And that was the moment I start to, I don't know, I start to think because in Taiwan the, the racial discussion is not really I mean in the recent year probably because the migrant workers but it's never about skin color because we, we went through colonial time, we went through all this uh, global economic uh, development, but 
the skin discussion is never really into our focus because probably because in Asia or in Taiwan we share similar skin color even to our colonized um, motherland. And then that was the moment I realized, ah, okay, uh, in my knowledge, I lack a lot of knowledge which I never noticed before. And I think it's very dangerous because in, in Taiwan, in the art world, we, we really base on, uh, we really talk about a lot of uh, decolonization and decolonial discussion, but without skin color. And as I realized at the moment, um, we, we had a lot to do. So since then, I, I start to um, think more about what 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 is lateness in Taiwan or in, in Asia, and I also see the a similar situation in in China too, except uh, in Guangzhou because in Guangzhou we have a very big uh, black immigrant, mainly from Nigeria, who based in Guangzhou. But in our world, it's also very very uh, narrow in terms of skin color. So then I started to do a lot of uh, field research in China, also in, uh, in West Africa, and try to, and also you know nowadays, China has a very big influence in African continents. So, and it's also not in the discussion of Taiwan either. So I feel like, okay, uh, we should, Talk something not only because I really like to criticize Chinese neocolonialism, but also that uh, I think it's something which the Mandarin speaker can do because when Western artists or Western filmmaker engage in a, in this discussion, they mostly don't speak Mandarin. So basically, people might speak English or French, but they don't know the other part of side what they are talking about. So then I, I find a space probably I can work on. And that was the, the moment I started to try to use my film to relate all these different area and different um, backgrounds. Yeah. Hope I answer your question. Yeah. Are there any questions from the audience? Don't be shy. I've got a question. Um, thank you very much for the talk. This is convenient to both of you. Um, this is primarily just for my kind of historical ignorance, so forgive me, but just to kind of go over the, in the general kind of history, was kind of after 1945 there was a kind of general constitutional framework for de democracy, but was it kind of most of the kind of civil liberties and freedoms that I think most international audience would associate with Taiwan as opposed to mainland China? Were they kind of only, only in the 80s, I think you said, that they it started to relax, and in your opinion, was that the kind of main trajectory for this big shift, I think, from the previous kind of studio-run films to people like Simon Liang and mm -hmm. Edward Yang in that kind of open trajectory that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, sorry, what is the question? <laughs> so it's just like, is that, I mean, is that yeah. actually overall correct and is that the kind of main factor um, of the kind of relaxing of the civil liberties for this kind of change? Yeah, I, I mean, of course, the, um, the, this you know how it, 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 it is very complicated, but um, the, the background of the um, of the era during the eighties was you know was one of the most critical elements that have you know give these these young filmmakers more uh, freedom and flexibility to make what they what they learned from the Western, and they could finally do something more like um, you know neorealism, not a healthy realism, and yeah, I think. You know, pop, pop, very much, um, very most of the reason are is about you know the change um, according to the political climates during during that time in Taiwan. Yeah. And I have a question on like um, in YouTube channels like from Taiwan and also in video games that Taiwan also got a big video games industry. There, it's very clear that you know they there is this. Um, they are trying to sh process the threat from in China. Um, you know, maybe they're making fun, poking fun of um, Chinese politics. But um, in your, in the more recent Taiwanese films, um, do you notice any reaction to that? Because, you know, Hollywood was reacting hugely to the Cold War. Um, but in those genre films, I was trying to figure out whether 
maybe in the horror films, <laughs> like you could. How do how 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 do people or filmmakers in Taiwan incorporate or psycho, that psychological fear or that threat of war or of anything? Yeah. Mm, I think I think in the most of Taiwanese filmmakers, they um, they they are not you know they still don't really like they, they still see the mainland China market as one of you know the most important. Markets in, in in Taiwan, but in the situation got a lot of change during these years, uh, during the recent years. So you know, we, we barely see um, you know film that um, in, that just as you say it's, but you know, in some kind of political films, um, like niche films, I do I did uh, notice that you know they will um, incorporate the um, you know the fear towards. Um, the CCP and also they are more willing to talk about you know pe topics that are um, related to um, the, the Chinese government but that is um, still the minority of the Taiwanese films yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think it's very interesting because I, I remember when I read your book you mentioned that in the recent Korean series there's like kind of a trend to Roman Romantic lies the North Korea. Like mm -hmm. so there was a drama. Somebody I think is from South Korea. Yeah, crash landing on me. Yeah, I, I mean, um, that's actually um my what I wrote um, uh, about my dissertation. Um, it, I think it's it's very interesting that we could find a connection between the inter-Korean relations and its own Korean cinema. And you know, when when the relations between the North and the South, uh. Is good. They tend to portray and North Korea as a good person, you know, as as their brothers. And when the, the relations be, uh, become worse, they just you know, but they don't criticize them. Um, instead, they criticize the um, the whole international, like the, the major power, the superpower, like the U.S., like China, and they still see North Korea as their brothers. So it's kind of interesting that we you know we could find this. Connection between the big screen and in, and the reality, and that's also, um, I you know what we can see in a lot of films, a lot of especially political films, uh, made by South Korea. It, it is um, a huge topic uh, in in South Korea filmmaking about North Korea characters. Are they just too scared to to say what they think? Or? I don't think they are scared. I think you know they still. They still believe that they are gonna, you know, um, you, uh, unite right. as one nation. Yeah. But it is, you know, I, I mean, it's it's not practical, of course. But um, you know, when they because they, after all, they are the same. Um, I would say they are the same people. Or, um, this, this, they, they are all Korean, and their enemies are like the U.S. That the the, the countries that separated them. So it it would like transfer the um, you know the, the attack to the major power. Yeah. I see. Cool. Any other questions? Um, if not, then we can just uh, you know like chat in private and mingle. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Thank you.